Great. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Thanks, Harriet. Thank you. Um, so um, Dr. Nembhard is a, a very distinguished uh, speaker today, so we're, we're actually very lucky. Um, she came to OSU from Penn State about a year and a half ago as the Eric Smith Professor of Engineering and as head of the School of Mechanical, Industrial, and Manufacturing um, as a, I'm a recovery engineer myself, and so I, I was I'm really impressed by both the breadth and the innovation of, of Dr. Uh, Nembhard's research. It ranges from topics like um, data visualization techniques to data-driven simulations, uh, patient care processes in the emergency department to process design for manufacturing of medical devices. So her uh, research has been recognized by multiple professional societies. Uh, she's also a, a leader in mentoring women and members of uh, students from racial and ethnic groups that are underrepresented in the engineering profession. So, very glad to welcome you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that that warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I'd like to give thanks to Dr. Harvey and Dean Nieto for the invitation and to all of you for taking the time to. Uh, come and attend this seminar on a Friday afternoon. I really appreciate your time. I already mentioned to Marie that I'm taking a little license with this as a research seminar in the sense that um, I'll give some highlights about my research and, and some indications of what you might take away from it. But I hope also in this talk and in this time to meet some new friends, uh, open up some collaborations, uh, perhaps uh, indicate some of the directions that the college and university are going that, that I think are, are interesting, and you know, leverage it for some things like this, in addition to sharing my research topics with you. So um, as Jeff said, I've been here for about uh, 18 months now as school head uh, for mechanical, industrial, and manufacturing engineering. And I'm still, uh, I brought a one postdoc and one PhD student with me to continue one aspect of, of my research. So trying to find that nice balance between my administrative responsibilities and my research. So I'm, again, uh, from that perspective, thankful for this opportunity to share some of the work that, that I've done with you. Um, before I dive in, I do want to tell you what to look for in this work. I gave it this title rather intentionally. When I say from non-wearable sensors, I'll talk about some of the work that my team and I did at Penn State. And when I'm saying to advancing telehealth care delivery, um, I'll bring up to the point where we're working on some proposals to do some of the fundamental work that would be important for telehealth from and operations engineering perspective, okay? Um, you may notice or critique then that the work uses prototypes. We use an off-the-shelf Microsoft Connect system for the sensors. Uh, I will propose that this we have a telehealth platform, but it's really just a video call on top of that uh, with some wireless sensing networks my point is that the, the technology, uh, the software, is not our main concern. Our main concern is really around the science that um, is within the operations engineering space. So I just want to set that, uh, set that up for you. Um, I'll also say that this is a very 30,000 foot level presentation. If you were looking for a bunch of engineering equations, you'll be very disappointed, okay? Um, so let me tell you how I plan to spend the time today. <coughs> I'll start with just some preliminaries, share some background on my college and my school, and then I'll talk about my family, both my biological family and my academic family. And then I'll give a bit of a research overview to indicate sort of how it is that an industrial engineer came to, to this space. And then, as many of you know, will know very well, the U.S. healthcare system is broken. I thought about extracting these slides. Of, you know, often I'm talking to people who are not healthcare research experts, but maybe just these, the few will give you some indication of why we've gone in this direction. 
And then I will highlight our work on early detection of Parkinson's disease, PD being the application space that we've worked on. And then I want to talk about some of our future directions, a proposal that we're, we're just putting together and submitting on telehealth integration for PD, and then some strategic opportunities, I think, and I'm hoping that that might be interesting for you in terms of how we might collaborate and, and uh, potentially move forward. Hopefully I'll do all of this very quickly and leave plenty of time for questions, uh, comments, discussions. Um, uh, my slides are numbered, so we can go back to whatever you might want some more detail on um, if that works for you. So the College of Engineering, uh, MIME is one of the five colleges in the college, oh, I'm sorry, one of the five schools in the College of Engineering. Um, it's a pretty large college in terms of public land grant institutions. It's the largest, 11th largest college of engineering in the US. Have about uh, 9,000 students altogether. It's grown tremendously in the past 10 years and is, has been increasingly successful in attracting research funding. The strategic plan for the college is really based on four pillars, building community, Transformation, edu transformational education experiences, research innovation, and being a partner of choice. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about those the the center of that education and research with respect to MIME. Um, it's an amazing team of about 55 tenure tenure track faculty, another dozen or so uh, instructors, and about 20 staff. 22 students who have the opportunity to um, advance their education in the titular areas of MIME, if you will, the mechanical engineering, the industrial engineering, the manufacturing engineering, but as well in energy systems, material science, robotics, new miners are coming up in aerospace humanitarian as well. It's a, a great group to work with in terms of faculty and staff. They have been, again, tremendously successful in terms of the research performance of the school just last year, about $14 million in research expenditures for FY17. A number of very successful junior faculty, career awardees, YIP awardees, and um, very active in terms of translating engineering work for impact into, um, in, into the profession. So I say that, you know, uh, you see here Cassie making friends with a Blue Origin rocket. There's work on new uh, piezoelectric materials. There's work on uh, systems for renewable energy proliferation. If it moves, if it's material, if it's people, if it's machines, I, I think this team is really well poised um, in these areas. And, and as I said, I'm delighted to be a part of this, uh, of this unit. So here's a picture of my family. The picture is a few years old now, but I, I really just love it. Um, my oldest daughter, Olivia, is in the white coat. She's now 20. She finished at culinary school. Uh, the middle daughter, Naomi, in the red coat, she's here at uh, CHS as a junior. And the baby is uh, a sophomore at CHS. Uh, as I said, the picture's a little old, but but I love it, and I mentioned nothing about my husband. The tall guy <laughs> in the middle, <laughs> the tall guy in the middle is also on the faculty here. We went to graduate school at Michigan together. We celebrated being married 25 years uh, last summer. Um, and, and as I was saying, this picture is, is really special for an, another reason. Does anybody happen to know what's on the Eiffel Tower, what's written on that first level of the Eiffel Tower? By seen, been to the Eiffel Tower. Well, if you zoom in really closely to that edge, along the first tier are the names of the mathematicians and scientists who contributed to the design and building of the Eiffel Tower. And one of those names is Poisson, of Poisson distribution. Okay. And if you go down the academic genealogy, his advisees and his and his, you come to um, George Danzig, 
who is very well known in operations engineering as a developer of the simplex method for solving linear programs. And his um, student was John Burge, who was my advisor. So my students all always get a kick out of this. Um, the reason I share this, though, with, with them and, and with you is to give some perspective <coughs> that I am very grateful for um, the work that we do as a part of the academy. And I tell my students that we are here to solve problems, right? Not necessarily just engineering problems, but to solve problems uh, full stop. And if our sort of academic forebearers, if you will, can build the Eiffel Tower, we can solve anything that is coming our way. So I, I also do want to just say a moment about collaborations. Collaborating is very important to me. My work has been highly collaborative throughout my career. Of course, my students have been very important to me. I've collaborated with a number of industrial engineering faculty, um, as well as folks in mechanical engineering across medicine and nursing, uh, as well as health policy. This one picture of us is uh, me just before going to see our first um, open heart surgery as a part of the work that we were doing with the Center for Health Organization Transformation. And again, this group and this interdisciplinary work has been uh, one of the things that's really energized the, the work that I do. And so I wanted to call that out. Uh, as Jeff said, my research has been um, fairly broad <laughs> across the disciplines, always by uh, connected by the science and, and operations engineering, as I said. So my fundamental work, uh, my PhD was in industrial and operations engineering from, from Michigan in 94. And so my early work really stayed right there uh, in that applied math space. And then I started really connecting it to industry originally manufacturing industry and traditional manufacturing industry at that, making cereal, making cars, uh, big GM plants, uh, General Mills plants, and General Motors. Uh, but one of the projects that I started working on as I got to Penn State was developing a manufacturing process for minimally invasive surgical instruments. So we're making these teeny, these tiny forceps that would be able to um, potentially do a one cell biopsy from the eye. That was sort of our, our sort of grand challenge, right? And we were vying for an engineering research center. We weren't quite successful in that, but did a number of other NSF projects and, and, and work. But from there, as we were doing this work in that healthcare application, when Penn State set its strategic plan around life sciences, I was asked to be the founding director for the Center for Integrated Healthcare Delivery Systems, which then opened up all of this other work and space. I'm just gonna to talk today um, a bit about some of this recent work, the most recent work on predicting Parkinson's disease and where we're going in terms of telehealth. I do want to mention just um, a little bit about funding. The main work, uh, the main funding for my work has come from two streams, if you will, from NSF. The funding stream that would be sort of the industry applications with the GOLI, which is grant opportunities for academic liaisons with industry, uh, SBIR program, and the Industry University Collaborative Research Center uh, work, as well as the pure science stream or engineering science stream, if you will, um, that was uh, ages ago called SMOR and now is just simply called operations engineering. So it's interesting to see that, that full cycle. Um, through my collaboration, so uh, we've also had work funded by NIH. I was one of the directors of the Clinical and Translational Science Institute with that funding going to Hershey Medical Center. Um, as well as, as I said, this collaborative research center in the healthcare space that brought industry partners into, um, you know, into participation with us. So um, lastly, as a part of this setup, I did want to share with you where we're going in terms of current proposal efforts, right? So 
operations engineering within NSF has sort of been through this metamorphosis. And more recently, if you look at the synopsis and you talk to the program directors about what they really are interested in funding, um, it, it is fundamental research on the analytical methods, no doubt about that, and it is in that core body of, of operations engineering. But I point out that, that they're also <coughs> stressing that, you know, just pure methodological work is not appropriate for the program, that there really does need to be an application domain with it. And this work that we're doing with public-private partnerships in healthcare is important within the, as I said, sort of the pure engineering uh, science uh, stream of funding. So this is really what, you know, where we're focused as a research team now and looking at how we can be competitive in this space with the work that we are doing, right? So I just wanted to set that out there as well and, and that shapes some of the questions that, that we're pursuing. Okay, so of course, you all know healthcare system is broken. Um, as I said, I'm sure this is, this is all very basic, but I just wanna pull a couple of things from this to emphasize how we started in, working in this space, okay? We know U.S. spends more than other countries on healthcare. Of course, longevity or life expectancy is not equivalent to health per se, but we do understand that uh, with respect to per capita spending, we are very high, and then with that compared to life expectancy, we are pretty low, right? This is not news. Uh, this this chart I found I found very interesting. Um, an ordered uh, an ordered set of healthcare spending of the population, and if we look at it maybe from right to left, read it from right to left. This is saying that the top one percent of the population is responsible for all of the spending to their right. So the top 1% is responsible for 20% of the spending. The top 5% is responsible for almost 50% of the spending, right? And so this was something that we were looking at as a team, uh, as I said, as, as we were starting the work at Penn State about eight or so years ago. And then thinking about that with respect to chronic disease, which of course also drives healthcare expenditure. And so a lot of the work that you see um, you know, in, in my Vita, if you will, is from this perspective, working on chronic disease. Of course, you know that these <laughs> on, the, on the left have a lot to do with each other. We did quite a bit of work with uh, Hershey Medical Center on care coordination for patients with CKD. Okay. But today I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease and some of the work that we've done there. Uh, you may know that Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder, affects um, about one out of every 50 people over the age of 65, and is uh, represented, its progression is represented in these five stages where the first stage, or stage one, is where the symptoms are pretty mild, isolated to just one side of the body, and may be pretty subtle, okay? On through stage five, where the patient can no longer rise and is either bed or chair, bedridden or chair-ridden, okay? So when we're looking at the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, it seems that it often takes a number of clinical examinations, uh, physicians visits, and it may be, especially in the early phase, we find something that is missed by some routine clinical examinations, especially from a, a generalist. A specialist, however, might pick up on some of the early signals uh, more readily, okay? Um, but in general, it's difficult to diagnose, and often people find that uh, getting to that specialist may not be particularly accessible. 
But when they do, and we, we worked with a really brilliant uh, neurologist at Hershey Medical Center, you, you, that specialist can discern even very subtle movements as indication of Parkinson's disease. So one of the examples that, that I often get uh, give is that you know, when we walk, there's this symmetry to our arm swing, right? But for a patient with Parkinson's, it might be just a little off, right? The, the, not quite a full symmetry. And that might be one of the early tells. Similarly, when we walk, um, the, the stride length and the time that it takes for the heel to leave the floor drags just a little bit in the early phases of Parkinson's. So what we were interested in, if you will, is how to translate this human expert into an expert system, right? How could we look at a patient's gait and from that gait pattern do an early indication, an early prediction, if you will, of, of Parkinson's disease? So that's where our work started in this area, uh, really just using, as I said, an off-the-shelf connect system to collect body position data on 20 nodes of the body, order that data in uh, an ordered table, do some pre-processing data mining, data mining algorithms to classify that data and suggest on a node-by-node -node basis was there a symmetry or some difference that could be detected and use that to predict, you, know, you can't really say that in terms of FDA rules, but, but use that as an early indication to flag the patient uh, for the possible onset of Parkinson's disease, okay? So those were the first couple of papers that, that we did. Again, using the non-wearable sensor of the Connect system to uh, really undergird the operations engineering work, if you will, of getting the data, processing the data, being able to validate that good decisions, good predictive ability was, was possible with the models and with the modeling. Okay. So, um, so that was kind of cool, right? And there's some cool videos so on our website of doing this. You know, this, this, this is, you know, this plays very well. It's very interesting. Um, attracted a lot of to the lab and this sort of thing. This is also, you know, important. Um, but then when you really want to get down to nitty gritty, say, okay, this is nice. This is a connect system. But how are we going to really deploy this as a medical product or medical device or medical innovation? You know, how does that work, right? Um, so this is where partnering with uh, Highmark and Siemens and AT&T helped us to understand what's really important for commercial viability of an idea like this, and what sort of issues we would have to uh, overcome with respect to FDA regulation, with respect to safety, of course, reimbursement, who plays for this kind of screening, and such, right? Okay, well, we're a good team, but we're a small team, so we had to focus. So the first couple of questions that we really looked at was, Really, if we have this framework of integrating this sort of non-wearable sensor system into a hospital setting, what exactly would that look like if we were doing this kind of screening for the patient? How would that information be incorporated into the electronic health record? How would it actually help to make decisions? Where would we need a specialist? Um, and how would we monitor the patient with Parkinson's disease on an ongoing basis, okay? So all of that, very complex, of course. So we settled in uh, first on, on two questions, okay? One around cost effectiveness, okay? And so in terms of cost effectiveness, our main issue, or the, the main question, we were using uh, qualies to represent the cost effectiveness of this approach. And the main question was, would this be cost effective in a home setting, uh, on a patient by patient setting? Would it be cost effective in a physical therapy setting? Would it be cost effective if it were a part of sort of a community screening? So that's how we set up that problem. 
Um, and we're able to look at the red line on this chart is if a patient is, I'll tell you the, the assumption, so the red line is if a patient is untreated, untreated Parkinson's disease. And then based on a, a, an existing database of Parkinson's disease patients, um, what does the treated population of Parkinson's look like? Okay, And then just do um, really a simple estimation, just looking at the area between these. And, you know, of course, this is, you know, not without criticism, it's criticism as well. But looking at the area between them and saying, well, if a patient was diagnosed at stage two, okay, and we were able to do it earlier, or if a patient versus if a patient was diagnosed at stage three versus earlier, what would be the opportunity to increase qualities? Okay, so as I said, with that and some estimates around the cost of the technology and deploying it, and some assumptions about what uh, you know what sort of care support would be required, we we were able to you know pretty quickly. Um, dispel the idea that you could ever really do this in a home, right, you know, at an individual person basis. And actually, um, it was a bit disappointing to find out, but better to realize in the model that it's actually not going to be cost effective as, as a part of a physical therapy regimen either. Really, it would have to be as a part of a low cost set of screenings, right, as would be done in a community health fair. So that, that's where we started looking next for for viability of, of the approach. Then in terms of, um, so if we have a community health fair screening, what would a telehealth platform look like and what would it have to do? Well, a number of things that are beyond our technical interests and capability, but a, a couple of things that it would have to do would be certainly to still be able to read the patient's bibliometric data and would have, to, um, would, would have to be able to communicate that information to the specialists in a way that would uh, not be prone to <coughs> so much error in, in terms of predicting the onset of Parkinson's. So that was kind of the next uh, area that we did most recently, actually last summer. Um, and my colleague Conrad Tucker, who's still at Penn State, came and talked about that work when, when he came here last year. But that part is what is continuing. So uh, to summarize, let me say where I think we are, okay, and where I think that we, we can go. So our, our presupposition is that telehealth systems that are enhanced with this sort of non-wearable sensor technology can support patient care in a few important ways, right? To collect the gate data remotely, unobtrusively, to be able to analyze that data accurately, to provide this health benefit at a low cost, as I said, in a community setting, to be able to store, manage, and communicate that information about the patient's Parkinson's disease progression to, uh, to the health uh, specialists and health providers. And I didn't speak of it specifically here, but sort of woven throughout a lot of our studies with Parkinson's is the, um, is, is the medication adherence question, right? So even if a patient has missed one dose, the asymmetry in the swing will, you know, re-accentuate and this sorts of things. So we found that we could pretty well start to detect even if, if one dose had been missed. So we can propose that telehealth may be well suited for Parkinson's disease, but there are a number of challenges, of course. How accepting of the technology will this population be? Um, how, how much synthesis can we bring to a patient's care when we're dealing with a multidisciplinary care team. Both of those have a number of challenges embedded within them. But then there are also these issues of um, time and timing. You know that the time, the, the visit is time consuming. You may wait a long time to get the visit. You may not have access to specialists in your community and then you're traveling to get that care and so forth. So 
those those current practices we we started to wrap our arms around and, and understand and then when we talk about the telehealth integration into the healthcare delivery also a slate of challenges right everything from who's going to benefit the most from it to um, who's going to pay again the stakeholders who's going to reimburse for for this care um, Many people are in expensive uh, uh, care facilities. How will that factor into the deployment of, of uh, the telehealth integration? Should it be just really as a as a as somewhat of a confirmator, a confirmation of Parkinson's disease, or should it be as as more of a predictive uh, tool? These sorts of things are, are all very important challenges that, that we're trying to work through. Um, when we're doing this, though, uh, what we propose uh, as we're going through these sets of challenges, what we propose is that if we want to understand how this technology can be integrated in the healthcare delivery, we're going to have to focus and order some of those challenges in order to, to, to move forward. So that was a proposal that we were working on, um, submitted just last week, in fact, on designing integration strategies to manage patients with Parkinson's disease. Okay? Um, the science behind this, if you will, is based on system dynamics and systems thinking you know, with, with respect to the operations engineering program. Um, but what we expect is that we would be able to look at very heterogeneous uh, populations of patients with Parkinson's disease and discern how such a technology should be deployed over time. Okay. So um, I think the only other thing I will say there is that you know, this, is, so this is where my work is taking off here. Like I just submitted this proposal last week, I'm going to be giving a course uh, that I designed for undergraduate students in engineering on technology and healthcare next term. Okay. And uh, hopefully I will be able to put together some interdisciplinary teams. That might be an interesting point at which to connect you know, with some of you uh, on this work. Okay, so uh, last thing I want to, to talk about and share with you, then I'll open up for questions, is, is what I see as maybe more of a strategic opportunity or, or um, new opportunities in this space, okay? So as I come in and, you know, as an administrator, looking at the strategic plan of the university and of the college, of course, just as had been at my former institution, Improving human health and wellness was a part of the, the plan. I hope it's still there. I don't know. The, we're on the strategic plan. For, so hopefully, it's, it's still there. It's, it's still there. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, and then for the college, you know, the college placed a couple of bets on, on robotics, as you know, and, and, um, and on advanced manufacturing. And we're starting to open up some discussions now on what does precision health really mean uh, for the college. There's been some discussion about the term. Is it precision health? Is it engineering for health? Is it called something else? And how, for now, Greg Herman said, it's just gonna be the H initiative. It's okay, I like that. That could be Harriet, that could be health, that could be Herman, the H initiative, okay? So we're now opening some discussions up on the H initiative and, and where it should go, okay? But of course, you know, it's not a far leap to see these things together on a page, right? That you're talking about health and human well-being. We're talking about robots and sensor technology. We're talking about these operations questions and being able to really translate our work for impact. What assets do we have? Well, of course, I try to stick to my lane first, right? And in MIME, we have uh, human factors in ergonomics. We have people in robotics, we've got people in operations engineering. Gee, what can we do with that, okay? Um, well, we have industry partners that are affiliated, our alumni are at companies at, at some of these same areas. So um, how can we leverage this integration as, as we move forward, okay? We did a little bit of an inventory, a quick inventory on the sorts of problems that people had done already in robots and assistive devices, uh, everything from uh, assistive robots, um, Bill Smart's <coughs> been doing work in, in this area, 
um, exoskeletons. Uh, my husband does work on, on using this sort of um, uh, robot suits in some sense uh, for learning functions. There are people doing, like me, non-wearable sensors. There are other people doing wearable sensors. There are people embedding sensors and working on teams for this, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we have some understanding about who's doing what. And then we have some understanding, as I said, of some of those questions um, that NSF is interested in, in um, investing in in order to translate this technology into practice. Right? So we have to keep that part in mind. The NSF Industry University Collaborative Research Center framework is one that has been used a number of times. At Penn State, there were several IUCRCs that existed. The work that we did there uh, for our center was a part of one, as I said, Center for Health Organization Transformation. Um, but the idea, you know, NSF is interested in investing in these because they help to build partnerships among industry, government, and academia. We get to, um, by that partnership, establish what is the research agenda, and everybody kind of chips in a little bit for, th for the funding model. And it is relatively small dollars, okay? This, this sort of model is relatively small dollars, but it is about bringing, bringing people together so there are the opportunities that are recognized for additional collaboration. So a number of other um, projects and funding emanated from, from the work that we did at Penn State, um, including some of the work that made the CTSI successful, uh, ultimately. So it's something that you know, was really strongly believed in. Uh, as it turns out, there is already an IUCRC in this space called Rose Hub, Robots and Sensors for Human Well-Being. Gee, what you can find when you know you use the wise internet, right? That that Rose Hub has been there and includes uh, these five universities already working together for the past year and a half in this space. So we put together a strategy for potentially having such a site here at OSU. Okay? We held a partnership workshop last uh, June, I think I, that a couple of folks know about that here, okay, brought everybody together to talk about what an agenda would, would really mean. We submitted the pre-proposal in October, we're encouraged to submit the planning grant. So we reached out to uh, these nine candidate partners, some of our alumni are there, and existing partners, a, a few new ones as well, and intend to move forward with a full site proposal later later this year okay so um that that's primarily what i wanted to share uh, i guess the the final thought that i'll leave with you is that you know the way that i go about this and uh, my research and even in some sense the way that i'm trying to to energize the school and, and the college is that you just got to get out there right i say play in traffic and have fun doing it <laughs> so thank you leaves a, a bit of time for questions, comments, ideas. You can feel free to, you don't have to necessarily ask me about my work, feel free to comment about your own work, how it might relate, um, discussions that you might want to have. Yes, sir. So, uh, thanks for the fascinating presentation. Oh, thank you. So I'm just, and, and not to get into the weeds, but I'm just curious about, say, for example, these sensors for um, um, telemedicine uh, in, the, in the Parkinson specifically. Mm -hmm. What what do you envision? Who do you envision would be the um, the people who would be where this would be applied to? People with a suspicion, a clinical mm -hmm. suspicion of or um, of Parkinson's, or people with with certain age um, yeah. criteria that will be the recipient. And then also then with that. What's the, what's the accuracy of this type of mm -hmm. uh, sensor detection mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and um, the rates of false positives and implications that those could have for mm -hmm. the lives and of these patients, etc. Any thoughts on that? Okay, that's not a complicated question at all, right? <laughs> no, but let me let me unpack it a little bit. And first, I will say that. Um, some of that I, I know not of and wouldn't actually try. I mean, some of the folks who are on our team who, who
who you know have their research and expertise in, in health services could definitely help to shape you know what would be a sound uh, screening policy, right? I know enough to know about it that I don't want to try to, you know, declare what that actually should be. But at the lay level, if you will, especially with Parkinson's, as we know that it's an age onset condition, you could conceive of some framework where um, with some age or where you're already having some intersections, you know, with, with, a, with a healthcare system anyway, that this might be an approach, right? Um, in our, I will say now, uh, in our naivete, when we, when we began, we thought, because we're engineers and, you know, we just think like this, that, oh, you know, you just, everybody's got, already got a Microsoft Connect in their house, right? Just walk by your micro, just before you start playing your games, you know, what, you know, it doesn't quite work quite that way. But, you know, there is some notion that it is fairly low cost, that it is fairly accessible, you know, that the sensors are. And there might be some interesting ways to, to think about, you know, a more individualized integration. Um, but I tried to be very clear about, you know, what I what we know, right, already from from what we've learned and uh, the ability to collect this sort of data, do this sort of data mining. And you know, FDA would not allow us to say that it actually is early prediction, right? We couldn't really move forward to say, here's a, here's a device or a product that will do an early prediction of Parkinson's disease, right? Just that, that will never pass um, um, authorization, right? Um, but framed as a potential uh, um, either screening or confirmation or disease progression tool, these we understand to have more, you know, uh, more possibility. And then I guess your the third part of your question was was really around. Um, uh, I guess I think of it as, well, not exactly cost related, but essentially, how are how are you going to be reimbursed for this? And this again is something that that we just really don't know. If you have an actual telehealth system. Who's going to pay for that? How would this be integrated? And, and that part I, I can't speak to as well. Um, but in terms of the errors, right? We can, and, and the paper, our papers do specify what is the likelihood of a type one and a type two error if you are trying to communicate this data between practitioners. But it does have a long way to go, for sure. Kind of building on that question, when you were you said in our naivete, we tried to look at this individually, but did you actually have longitudinal data? Because I could imagine where you could, if there was some simple things in people's homes over a long period of time, and I saw that with your data analysis expertise, you do some change point analysis, analytics, mm -hmm. that you could perhaps, you know, and maybe it would just be, you know, next time you go to the doctor, you know, you might just mention that there seems to be a change in the laterality of your gait or the smoothness of your gait or something like that. Mm -hmm. now, I don't think you can make a ton of money off the screener like that, but <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Also following up on that, I mean, why would you want to restrict just one sort? If you had if you had wearable sensors, I mean, there's a lot of different neurological and skeletomuscular diseases which mm -hmm. affect gait in very specific ways. Absolutely. And a lot of times clinicians have a hard time differentiating between Parkinson's versus Alzheimer's versus, you mm -hmm. know, um, mm -hmm. micro strokes, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would be so cool um, mm -hmm. if you if you could design the system to not be a predictor but a differentiator. A, a very interesting question. Yeah, a, a very um, – and I had not thought about that. You know, certainly we thought about this notion of um, – which you know, which sort of disease or application area would we like to consider? And really, it's in in some ways it's because of the way that we go through the process of having work reviewed, right, and and funded, right. You have to be able to make a fairly clear case, right. Uh, if I just say, you know, I have a telehealth system, and and we did try that, you know, the very broad sweep just leaves so much open room for critique and, you know, gaps. So we do have to narrow it in, in some sense and then say, here are, the, here are the parts of that problem that 
that we can solve, right? Early, especially early on. Um, I do think and expect that, you know, as we get more of a, um, an established record on this branching out and thinking about what does it mean, for example, and the sort of differenti differentiation like capacity. Versus, you know, asymmetric That's right. Versus width versus, you know, a, a whole bunch of different things. That's right. Um, that would be really cool. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. I saw a hand here and then one to the back. Okay, and building on that. <laughs> Have you considered installing sensors just in hospital hallways, or clinic hallways, and scanning everybody who walks by? Mm -hmm. Once you've got the hardware installed, the processing is free. Yeah. And that yeah. way, you know, the doctors can send somebody to walk down that hallway if they need a test, and anybody else gets caught and uh, may actually get information that's useful. This this is absolutely you know um, I've I've certainly seen um, this sort of idea in sort of a prototype in like the what is it the Verizon Center that they have for a hospital of the future right just the the ability to capture everybody who comes in of course you know then you've got privacy concerns and so on and privacy is not a concern because if, if a doctor sees someone walking and diagnoses something. What is that doctor going to do about it? Yeah. Same situation. Yeah. Uh, you know, I again, I, I don't disagree, but I try to frame what is the, the science that our team can work on in terms of operations engineering. And for me, I, I would say that's a bit out of scope, right, uh, to be able to look at these privacy issues. I don't have the expertise, but I think it's certainly possible. I saw here first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Mithar, for your talk. I was delighted to. I'm recently retired from HP, so I was delighted to see my uh, former colleagues are uh, partnering with HP Labs. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, in environmental health, and as you were uh, giving your presentation, I was thinking of the applications in epidemiology, especially environmental epidemiology, where we Kind of need to have this, uh, as you mentioned, this longitudinal data, mm -hmm. uh, almost a pre-screen. And you mentioned access, and I have elderly in-laws, and I understand what you mean about them going for some type of a, uh, a doctor's appointment or clinic. Mm -hmm. Have you considered, as part of your grant, um, I just want to put this idea out there, of creating a mobile lab where it goes to patients that are high risk, either they have family mm -hmm. history or they had an occupation, they worked in an occupation mm -hmm. where the uh, prevalence of Parkinson's is, is uh, high. Yeah. You know, I think that's a marvelous idea and marvelous intention. Um, we did uh, we we did apply. We're not successful, but we did apply for a, a grant in community paramedicine essentially with that notion of where is the capacity to, um, in this case, you know, motivated by you know, some different conditions, um, um, heart failure, for example, or, uh, or heart attack. So if they've been discharged, then um, what sorts of capacities would there be to you know, do community paramedicine? It's along the lines, I think, of what you're saying, that there might be some um, there, there might be some preliminary conditions, some a priori's that suggest here is when or where a patient might be screened, and and I think that it does have, you know, I think that it does have possibility. Yeah, we weren't successful, as I said, with community paramedicine work, um, but that that was at Penn State, and you know, there are different um, different regulations around the deployment of. Uh, of ambulance services in different communities, and we found that here it's it's more privately held. Yeah. Do you think that there would be opportunity at Oregon State? You know, so if if I, it's interesting with respect to this H initiative, right? We're trying to start and say, okay, well, where are our assets, right? And what can we really leverage? And where is the opportunity for that to have an impact? And a number of things have to, and, and what's 
fundable, what's feasible, right? Where do we have, you know, where do these, you know, what's a sweet spot of where these things intersect? Um, so I don't know that I could necessarily, you know, uh, screen that, if you will, right now, but I think it's de definitely worth thinking about how these things come together and how we could bring some teams if there are interesting problems to say, okay, we have a unique chance to compete in this space because of A, B, and C. This is what I, I hope that we will do uh, over this year. Yeah, right? So maybe this comes as a nice follow-up. Do you see how our college, our faculty, could possibly reach out and partner and help in some ways put something together? I'm just, you maybe aren't prepared to say it today. I'm sure you know who we are, but just thinking about it. Well, you know, as, as I said, um, it's, it's, it's this, right? You play in traffic, right? And you have to make those traffic conditions. You know, I can say that, you know, this, this is not, this is not um, magic or news, right? Bring people together, see what's on the, you know, kind of scan and see who, who's, who's doing what, right? And figure out how you can uh, move forward with, with, with some, you know, shared vision and goal. Um, so I would certainly welcome the opportunity, uh, part of your strategic planning um, uh, committee, I'd certainly welcome the opportunity as you start thinking about implementation of just how to do this, what, what makes sense. Um, and I certainly will try to keep the, um, the lines of communication open and let you know when we're having our next meetings for this and what some of the next steps are. I think that's a part of it, right? Just sort of what are what are the bridges that will bring folks together? Sounds perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I'm definitely part of the traffic. I'm the clinical research supervisor over at Samaritan, and uh, conduct mostly oncology, cardiology type trials. Um, but we do have some business development projects that, that look sort of similar to this. Mm -hmm. um, we also have partnerships with Dr. Ackerman medicine mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. other things but um, so I just kind of wanted to be here to see what's going on in engineering and see mm -hmm. if there's opportunities for partnership yeah. with the hospital and, uh, there's like I said there's various avenues that we're going to explore to make those things happen and potentially find uh, physicians that are interested in this kind of implementation and getting a protocol written up and um, yeah you guys have an IRB here and we have an IRB Function oversight projects. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank, thank you for that. Yeah, I think that 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 is very important and good to know. Um, obviously, we don't have a medical school here, and so that does really change the game in a, in a number of ways. So I know that Greg Herman was saying that with the H initiative, if you will. He is going to be looking at what our peer institutions and aspirational peer institutions have done as far as direction when, uh, th when there is not a medical school. I think it, it, plays, it, it has to play very differently, right? So even just me, just, just my box of work and, and being very prudent, right, and practical, my work that was with colleagues in uh, emergency department and, you know, data, you know, I don't have one nearby, right? So even just sort of thinking about, okay, well, Parkinson's disease, and uh, we have met with a couple of specialists here, or chronic disease more, more broadly, there is maybe more opportunity, I think, you know, in, in that sort of space where we can lead. Again, um, I've said that unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes, right? So it's not just about how can we figure out what might work, right? But how can we really be out front with what is likely to work? Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate you showing your family history throughout that. I, I always like it when people do that to remind me of our We all are, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So going off that, uh, on a personal level, my, I watched my dad was diagnosed relatively early with Parkinson's, so I mm -hmm. watched the progression from the early to late stages. Mm -hmm. um, so in a practical sense, it, I have a hard time envisioning him in the early stages throwing on a robotics thing like all 
full part of his arms to watch how his body moves. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's so much interest, so I'm wondering what the kind of human psychological aspect is of that and kind of how accepting people are, especially considering the age groups that you're considering uh, mm -hmm. looking yeah, the, the exoskeleton work was uh, not with Parkinson's, just want to be clear about that. That, that was more on uh, learning for human performance, right? And for example, I don't know exactly what was done in that project. That was sort of the, the you know, aggregate of, of the work that people were doing around the school. But um, I do know, for example, uh, of a group that was doing work with athletes and just taking, you know, just doing um, free throws, right? What are you thinking? How do you move, et cetera? How do you learn how to become a better basketball shooter, for example? So it's not necessarily just for um, you know, disease, but more health and human performance and human well-being extended a uh, activities as well. I, I agree with you. For Parkinson's disease, we did understand very early that you know, having a, a, a non-invasive non-wearable, unobtrusive mechanism for collecting that data was essential for, for patients with PD. Yeah. Should we hold there then? Let me? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.